Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Happy New Year, and welcome to the new season of current work lectures in collaboration with the Architectural League of New York. My name is Nader Tehrani, for those who don't know me, and I'm honored to host you here tonight, both as the Dean of the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture of the Cooper Union, as well as a new board member of the League myself. It's a great honor to be part of their team, and equally so, to host you here tonight. I want to thank Billy Tien as the president of the board of the directors of the Architectural League, uh, Rosalie Genevro as the executive director, and Anne Rieselbach as program director. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, New York State Council on the Arts, with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature. Tonight, I'm also happy to welcome Stephen Rustow back to the Cooper Union from his sabbatical in Naples, where he is due in a couple of days. There he's undertaking a series of ambitious and studied transformations of several preciously detailed projects. Professor Rustow has been an esteemed proportional professor at the Cooper Union for many years, and al alongside Caroline Voss, he's led their firm Muse Museo Plan. Please welcome Stephen to the stage to help introduce tonight's lecturer, Roisin Hinehan, a dear friend and, of course, a partner of Hinehan Peng. Well, thank you, Nader, for that kind introduction, and good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here for this first in the new season of um, Current Works programs. They've been absolutely marvelous programs over these last years, and I've seen um, from my perch on the other side of the Atlantic uh, all of the lineup for this coming season, and it makes me regret um, somewhat not being in New York um, and not being able to attend on a regular basis. But I was thrilled when Anne sent um, a query as to whether I uh, would be available to introduce tonight's guest. Um, because it happened to fall on a time when, for completely extraneous reasons, we were going to be in New York, but also because I'm an enormous admirer of the work of uh, Hinehan Peng. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, and I'm delighted to meet in person Roisin Hinehan and to be able to introduce her to you tonight. Uh, Roisin Hinehan and her partner Shifu Peng formed their firm uh, eponymous firm, I'm not going to keep repeating Hinehan, um, in 1999 here in New York City. And they had both been working in other offices prior to that. But it's significant that two years later, they moved their office and their entire practice to Dublin. And they did so, I'm sure for all sorts of good reasons, but the proximate cause was that they had won an important competition for an administrative building for County Kilgore uh, in Ireland. Um, and one of the reasons that that's significant is that points to the extraordinary role that competitions have played in the development of their practice. Um, if you spend a little bit of time on their website, and I encourage you all to do that, it's quite a wonderful website, um, you'll notice that they've entered a great many competitions. In fact, the only thing that's more impressive then the number of competitions they've entered is the number of competitions that they've won. Um, I counted 20, which makes one for every year that they've been in practice, and virtually all of those have led to remarkable commissions, many of them by now built or just being completed. Um, one of the consequences of having a practice which engages in competitions, it seems to me, is that it provides you with extraordinary opportunities for both a range in terms of sizes and in terms of building types. And their built practice attests to exactly that. They have built very large buildings and very small ones. Uh, they have built a great many cultural buildings and among them a great many museums. And I hope we'll both hear about those and have a chance to discuss them at greater length uh, after Roisin's uh, lecture. 
Um, but there is something quite remarkable about a practice which is so motivated and developed uh, by an engagement with major competitions. Of course, the competition they're best known for is uh, the Pyramid Museum or the Great Egyptian Museum at Giza. Uh, they won that competition in 2003. From what I've read, the building is to be inaugurated, at least in part, this year. It was the competition that brought them to international attention. And so it's fair to say that they became an overnight success after 15 years of struggle. And this building, I think, will uh, make everybody uh, uh, let's say that it's been anticipated for so long that I think it will bring even greater attention uh, to their work. I had the occasion to first see their work in person with um, a project that's on the other end of the scale, probably one of their smallest projects, and it was one of those wonderful serendipitous visits where you don't know that you're going to see a project. In fact, I had gone to see something quite different, which was the long room at uh, University Library in Dublin in Trinity College, one of the great spaces um, in the world, certainly one of the most remarkable library buildings in the world. And I wasn't at all aware uh, that there had just been completed a quite wonderful series of spaces, quite small, that served both as an introduction to the building and, of course, to the manuscript, the Book of Kells, which is one of the most precious objects in the university's collection. Um, and so as I was entering the building, anxious after having stood in line for half an hour to get up to the long room, um, I found myself going through a rather small and very concisely designed sequence of spaces um, that were introducing me to the history of the building and to the Book of Kells itself with very beautiful illustrations and a great deal of background. And the sequence of spaces in what was a very compact and tight space led to a very modest but beautifully detailed stair that turned one around twice and then brought one up. And with one last turn, you found yourself on the long axis of the long room. It was absolutely breathtaking. And one of the things that was so wonderful about the entry space was the modesty of the means and the kind of elegance with which that sequence had been achieved. And I had no idea whose work I was looking at, but when I went home to uh, the house of the architect with whom I was staying, I said I had this really terrific experience, which was the entry into the long room and then the long room itself. And uh, Michael Cullinan, who it turns out is a mutual friend, smiled and said in a brogue which I won't try to imitate, ah yes, that's our Hinahin Peng. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to introduce Roshin Hinahin. <laughs> Thank you all very much. It's, um, it's a little overwhelming to be here, I'll, I'll say. So I'll just start. Uh, there's a lot of people here I know I haven't seen in many, many, many years. So uh, yeah, here goes. I'm going to uh, start talking about a project that we did in Northern Ireland. It's uh, the Giants Causeway Visitor Centre. It's located on a World Heritage site. Um, and it's, it's really famous for the uh, it, it's the entire cliff, but the Giant's Causeway itself is, is there. It's just that little bit there. But what's really most remarkable about this, this whole site is the entire cliff. In fact, Samuel Johnson said about the Giant's Causeway, it's worth going to see, but, sorry, it's worth seeing, but not worth going to see. And that's a lot of people's experience because the causeway is quite small, but the cliff, the whole landscape is, is quite amazing. So this is the causeway, uh, and it's a basalt formation that was formed from a lava flow, gave these uh, hexagonal stones. Um, so there's a site, and there's a, the causeway, so the site for the visitor center. Um, and there were two, two elements, I suppose, to the project. There's the car parking. People are, are, everybody has to arrive by car and there's a visitor center itself. But what we really wanted to focus people's attention on was the, the cliffs and that whole uh, kind of cliff landscape. So what we decided to do was to create two 
two cuts into the landscape. So it's a slightly sloping site, about a, a 10 meter difference across the site. And then one cuts into the landscape and one comes out. So one conceals the car parking and then and the other has the visitor center. And in between the two, there is a, a walkway that brings you up to the the cliff walk, which then brings you along the cliff path. So it's trying to to get people, I suppose, to refocus from the, the just the object of the causeway to the entire landscape. And then from the other side, so there is that cliff. So the building is dropped down. You can just about see the building there as it's uh, coming up above the cliff line. So the, the basalt itself is not very strong. It's only strong when you bring it together. And we, we wanted to work with the stone in some way um, and had to find a way to do that. Um, we couldn't use the stone from the, the site because it, it is a World Heritage Site. Um, so we had to devise a strategy for using it. So just looking at the organization of the site, there are the two cuts. And then the, these are the two elements, the car park and the visitor center. So we, we pulled the entire site together into kind of an, a singular ordering system. But, and what we wanted to do is, it was, there's a lot of stuff happening on the site. Um, you, there, there are a million visitors a year to this site. It's kind of a, a small rural site, a uh, huge amount of cars. So by uh, making the car parking as economical as possible, as uh, precisely as possible, we used that grid then and drew it across the building. And then further subdivisions start to um, organize the uh, facades. So the basalt, this is what it looks like in the quarry. Large boulders. The boulders in, in the quarry are, it, the basalt in Northern Ireland is not very, very strong. And it's typically used for hardcore under roads because there's a lot of cracks in the boulders. So when you extract it for building stone, um, there's a huge amount of wastage. There's no testing on it uh, as a building stone. So uh, we wanted to use it. The client who is the, the National Trust also wanted to use it. So we, it was tested, and you can see that the flex, flexural strength is very weak, uh, and the compressive strength is okay, but there's a lot of fluctuation in it. So what that meant was that we couldn't, we couldn't use it as a cladding stone. We couldn't uh, bring it down to 50 mil, or even a little bit more. Uh, so we had to use it in compression, and um, you know if you think about th those. Uh, columns that are used in compression, the slenderness ratio around 5 to 1. Some of our columns were at 40 to 1. So we worked with Tim McFarlane, and um, he um, developed this system where we stack the stones, but when it, when it gets quite thin, we um, it, it's in, a tension rod is introduced into it. So the stone is stacked, and then there is a tension rod brought through, and this is, uh, and, and, and I suppose the other thing then that we needed to do is we needed to accommodate the amount of cracks and breaks in the boulders. So it, rather than telling them every joint line that had to be developed, there is a system of control lines here. And then we allow the contractor, depending on the uh, size of the stones that were coming out, we allow them to either break it down to 150 mil, 300 or 450. So depending on this, the boulders that are coming out of the quarry, you can actually see that in the facade where there were a lot of cracks because it'll be a lot more jointing in the stone. And these are some of the stones. They're the tension and that's to look, uh, for them to uh, place, uh, get it in place. And this is then coming up to the top of the facade just before the capping piece goes on. And then this is the stone inside the building. So the building materials are quite simple, stone both inside and outside. In fact, we use the basalt as well in the concrete on the floor. And then outside, so this is on that cliff path looking back over the landscape. And there's the uh, visitor center in the evening. We're also working um, on a project in Canada, in Peterborough, the Canadian Canoe Museum. Um, when one of the things that we, we found very interesting about the canoe, in a way, was in a way, the precision of its design and how well suited it is to Canada. 
it, it's ideal, of course, for navigating all the water, but, but it, it's light enough that it can be carried from one watercourse to another. So the, the way that the materiality of the canoe allows it to be used in this very different series of ways. And of course, then there's the form of the canoe, it's so beautiful, the, uh, the way wood is used. Um, and our site is in Peterborough, which is there, it's along the Trent Severn waterway. Um, um, I, I think one of the things about this drawing is the way that as the water cuts through the landscape, how it starts to carve space and create space as it folds through, uh, through the landscape. Our site is beside Peterborough Lift Lock, it's just there. The Lift Lock is a, a tourist attraction in the area, it's a National Historic Landmark, and I'm going to get this probably wrong, but I think it's the largest hydraulic lift lock in the world. I think it's one of the largest mass concrete structures in the world, so there's no reinforcement used in it. So there's a lot of superlatives attached that, to that lift lock. And our site is just here. Um, the other thing about the canoe, so this is a canoe museum, and they, of course, have a lot of canoes. Uh, you know, uh, they're very interesting objects, but it's more than just about the canoe. It's also about the activities related to the canoe, and the, the museum has a lot of water programs. So, in a way, we had to try to make a museum that both has the space for all of those activities, but also has a relationship with uh, all the activities that are happening outside. And actually, this is a photo of one of the um, events that the Canoe Museum have, uh, where everybody piles into the basin and they go up uh, between the, you know, the two levels of the canal. So this is on top of the lift lock. Uh, so when we started, when we came to the project, I suppose the first thing we started to think about was all of these superlatives, if you like, uh, related to the lift lock. So, um, and that in a way became the elephant for us. You know, it was this big, big thing on the side. But of course, it has a very small footprint because it's big vertically, but in, in, in its footprint, it's quite small. So we started to think about the tower and, and the plinth, about ways of building beside it, you know, because this is the tourist attraction in Peterborough. Um, so, you know, the tower and the plinth, the United Nations, or the Guggenheim. So we thought, okay, if the lift lock is the tower, then the museum essentially becomes the plinth. So we're doing with vertical and horizontal, and they two come together on the site, rather than thinking of the museum in isolation. Um, like, I suppose our, our, our approach to this, because of the site, was very much about how we would work in this landscape. It is a very, very flat landscape. And in fact, there is a slope across the site, but it's a completely engineered slope. Uh, partially to do with the excavation of the canal. So that's looking from the top. There is a site, there is a visitor center currently for the lift lock, uh, which is going to be demolished. So we'll be building there. Uh, this is James Terrell's Irish Sky. One of the things we were interested in is the way that the landscape can actually focus you. So when you're in this space, you don't see anything. It's just completely focusing your attention up on the sky. And we're interested in the way that the landscape can make space. Uh, and as, again, going back to that image of the water, how curving form can start to create a series of different spaces. This is Alto's boat, that where the underside starts to, by the way it's formed, starts to create space in the water. So there's our site. So we kind of took a ripple and pulled it out over the landscape. And that starts to create these series of outdoor rooms. And so we kind of started to think about it as this kind of necklace of outdoor event space on the water. The, the museum is currently in um, a factory building, so they have no relationship to the water. So this is a chance for them now to move to a waterside location, and that, that was quite important. So the first space is kind of focused on the lift lock the second space on the canal, and then the third space to the south. Um, of course, being Canada, it's quite cold, so taking advantage of those uh, summer, summer days. And then together, it kind of creates one big space that looks along to the water. 
So, you know, this image of these events in summer in this kind of lawn that drops down to the canal side and on the roof of the, the museum, this terrace that looks out over the landscape and to, to the water. So this is, so the building itself is this very uh, simple uh, one-story building, the roof of which is developed as a green roof and then the outdoor space, kind of this series of rooms that look onto the water. And then inside, we thought about the space alongside the ripple, if you like, being this continuous kind of space with a cafe, there's pre-function spaces um, and entry space. And then, of course, in winter, we also, you know, it's obviously not sunny there all the time, but they have a lot of activities in winter, ice skating, different um, activities along the uh, water as well. So then the organization of the building, I mean, it is, it is a museum, and they do have some very sensitive pieces in the collection, which, in a way, when we came to it, we thought, oh, you know, they're canoes, they've been outside, but actually, a lot of the canoes have, are made with wood, and they have uh, skins, so they're actually quite sensitive. So we layered it at the back with most of the dark space. There is a large storage area. There is actually quite a lot of dark space. Then there's, uh, there's kind of a, a connection space, and then this event space along the front where there's cafes, arrival, different uh, activities. We felt it was very important that that front space become um, energized, if you like. And then a shaded space, and finally the green space dropping down to the water, and the water itself. So in section, uh, the building itself, quite simple, it's just this really one-story space. So it's built into the landscape at the back, then it kind of starts to pull out, and then it's fully out at the south. So this is what it looks like. Um, this is looking from the south, so you can see the spaces along the water. Another thing that is kind of, is actually very charming about the museum is that Currently, when you walk into it, there are canoes, you know where you are immediately, because you don't walk into a, a, an arrival space, you actually see the exhibit, so you completely sense what the museum is about. Uh, and we wanted, in some way, to try to, to capture that. So, this front space here, we, we're hoping that it's almost like a shop window or some kind of a window to the activities that are in the museum that they might be able to pull some of the canoes out. People they make me canoes there, they might be able to pull some of those out. The arrival space, the cafe is here and, and so you can see these activities as they kind of uh, enliven that space and then of course um, would help. The other thing is that you've got a lot of connection between what's happening on the water. There's a landing area here, so a lot of their activities would be coming in across that you'd have a connection between those two areas. And this is the building as it's sitting on the site, and um, actually in that last slide you can see there that the, the lift lock is quite small, small in plan in relationship to the building. Um, and looking back here. The, the, there's kind of um, a precision, I suppose, about the canoe. It was made of birch. When, if there's any damage, you can repair it with materials that are available alongside the water. So the approach to the landscape is looking at that as well, that, the, that it's not seen as something that's decorative, but rather that this is a productive landscape. So we're using uh, edible plants there. And hopefully there, there's a cafe that, uh, and there's also um, an event space that some of those um, plants then will be used in the food that's provided in the museum. So here you can see looking from the, the lift lock as the way it pulls out along that road level and then at, at the lower level um, the event space alongside the water. Um, and this, the Palestinian Museum is a project we've worked on for five, five, over five years. It's, um, it's set in the West Bank. It's um, in, in the, the hills of the West Bank. And it's set in this terraced landscape. It's, it's, it's a Mediterranean terraced landscape where you've got the, the hills are terraced to allow the farmers to catch the water and provide a flat space for farming. And one of the things about that area is that the landscape has been so densely inhabited that every single part of it has in some way 
been been touched. We say, unlike the the area around maybe the Giant's Causeway, where there is still kind of areas, this this landscape is a, is a very intensely marked landscape. And the Altar Cavino, where he talks about the the city does not tell its past but contains like the lines of a hand. There was something about. Uh, the fact that the, the kind of, I suppose, the telling of a narrative through uh, mark, material marks that we were interested in. And uh, on the site the, that, we, that the museum is located on, it is located on a hillside site. Uh, it was formerly uh, uh, farmed and you had these agricultural walls. Now, it, ha it hadn't been farmed recently, but we were interested in using these kind of co uh, contour marks. And one of the things about, uh, when you go to the site, you notice that within the crevices on the walls, you have this whole plant life, because that's where the water is caught. And you have kind of this whole thing, uh, other world, if you like, that happens just along those vertical surfaces. Uh, the other thing about the site is that it's on a hilltop, facing west, and from the site, you can see the Mediterranean. It's an amazing view. But also, because um, so many um, Palestinians, of course, can't get to the Mediterranean from the West Bank. This was um, an installation that the museum did where they projected the sea and put some sand on the floor. Ingwan Ban was there at the time, so he took this video. Um, of course, what's so amazing is that these children uh, actually haven't seen the sea. So we wanted to take advantage, or not take advantage, we wanted to really orient the museum around that west-facing view. Okay, okay. So this is a competition, and um, they, uh, the client, the Welfare Association, they uh, wanted to develop the museum in phases because it's so difficult it was to get into the West Bank. They weren't really sure about how big the museum should be, so they decided that the first phase was going to be a hub, so it would have the administration for the museum and a small temporary exhibition area that would enable them to test the exhibitions and how, I suppose, how the museum would work and then later phases would, would be added on. So. There's a site, uh, let's see, sorry. Uh, there's the, it's in Birzeit University, so there's the university and there's our site. It's a four hectare site, it's about maybe eight or nine acres. Um, and that's looking at it a bit closer, that's um, the light gray there are these kind of uh, rocky outcrops and then the dark gray are are ones that, I think there are uh, some walls. So we started to think about, you know, if you put a uh, master plan, you, you put a grid, but obviously this doesn't work so well because this site is quite uh, steep. So then by using the contours, uh, but obviously we had to be a bit more nuanced on that, so we transformed the lines uh, with intermediate control points and then start to pull them to the contours. Um, we decided that the first phase should be built at the top because this is the first phase that it should have some presence. It's not such a large museum. It's 3,800 square meters, about 40,000 square feet. And then future phases would move down. And then it's organized around the view to the west, which is um, there to the left-hand side of the page. That did set us up for some problems later on because uh, this building was designed to lead gold and the west facing sun, especially in summer, was quite an issue that we had to deal with. So there is a site plan as it finally was developed. The museum is a fairly simple building. It's one floor, primarily one floor, and then we took advantage of a hollow in the site and put in a second floor which contains some learning spaces and also some of the plant spaces. And around that, sorry, oops, uh, we put in an amphitheater which had the advantage of being shaded from the west wind, which can be quite strong up in the hills. So there's the plan, central entrance, administration to the north, exhibition here down to the south, there's a stair that brings you down to the learning center, and there's the amphitheater. Uh, so the museum is kind of almost like a fairly simple stone an object, it forms a crown to the hill. Um, the 
the, the site is four hectares. And in that climate, which is actually a, a very nice climate, and in summer it gets, it's, it's hot, but it's not unbearable by any means, we, we were interested in, in trying to uh, use the landscape. So with, we worked with a uh, Jordanian ar architect, uh, Lara Zirakat, to develop the, the landscape. And it's based around the movement from the cultural landscape to the natural landscape. This is a photo we took uh, for a site visit. It's Wild Time. And we were there with a um, Palestinian architect and one of the facilities um, managers from the university. And what they're doing here is they picked up the time. And they were collecting it. It was, um, and they were talking about the different dishes that you could make with it. And then they were talk went on and talking about different events associated with it. And, I suppose there was a sense that from what was grown there, you could su suddenly kind of find a way into traditions, holidays, into a way to tell and to maybe develop a narrative, not the only one, but a narrative about that place. So this is this idea of this terrace landscape. And it's developed with the, the cultural landscape closest to the museum on this side here, and then it kind of moves down the hill to the natural landscape. So closest to the museum, you have the pomegranate, the fig, the grape, the orange, and, and again, I suppose similar to the Canadian Museum, uh, th this idea that you could, in, in the cafe, you could sell food, uh, that, that uh, is seasonal with, with what's being grown at the time. But we, there is also this thing that with the cultural landscape that if you take the orange, it came from Asia, it's not actually native to that region, that, that it also starts to kind of talk about the centrality of that area to trade routes um, and, and to movement over time. Uh, and then moving on down, you've got the olive, the uh, almond, uh, the field orchard, the medicinal orchard, and then finally to the indigenous forestry. Picnic grasses, which are quite significant in spring when the rains come. And then finally down to the scrubland, which is what was on the site when I was there, oregano, rock plants, and crocuses. So there were the ideas, so then about making it. In a way, even though we were taking a lot of from what we found on the site, we were being, I suppose, very conscious about it. So, um, so we, we, took, we were taking all the stone that was on the site and forming it into these very deliberate terraces. So these, this year, these field stone walls that are starting to be moved in and formed from that landscape. This is an early construction photo. So the site itself has an overall grid that's laid over it that orders everything. So, uh, so there's the grid. Here is the lower, the lower terraces. This is the building, and these are the upper terraces. These are some of the construction drawings that were issued. Uh, and this is the site plan as it finally was developed. You can see here there's an outcrop there that we decided to keep, so move the, rather than uh, kind of blasting it out to keep our terraces going. And this is the museum as it's in place. So you can see that it's, it's kind of, it connects into that landscape, but it, it, it heightens it. We're not, we're not trying to pretend that we weren't there. In terms of the building, the building is kind of seen as this, like I say, it's not a huge building. It's, uh, and we wanted to give it a mon monumentality, a scalelessness. So it's kind of envisaged as this stone object uh, at the top of the hill. And so it's formed with these stones that come to points. And one of the things that we wanted was that it have, have the, I suppose, the simple geometrical clarity almost of, a, of a, an icon in some way. So that from the inside, it had that uh, simple monumentality and also from the outside. So what that meant was that we, so I suppose that idea is all fine when you do the model, but of course, a building has thickness. And therefore, if we were going to have a pure geometry on the outside, we needed to have a separate pure geometry on the inside. So we had an inner surface setting out, and then we have an outer surface for setting out. And then in between the two of them, because we didn't want to have any structure inside the building, we used a thickness in between those two surfaces to have, um, to have long span structure. So we have upstand beams there. 
above the slab of concrete that forms the roof. So between the stone on the outside and the concrete on the inside, we have upstand beams that gives the support that allow us to get that clear span across the space. And these are those upstand beams, that geometry, and that's without the outer shell. Uh, and again, these are the drawings that went out for construction. So there's the, that's the setting out for the interior, setting out for the exterior shell, and that's the two laid together. So we didn't do center points of structure. Uh, we went to surfaces. Uh, and then again, three-dimensionally, that's the outer, the inner, and that's the setting out for the upstand beams. And then that further got subdivided down to order things like lights, sprinklers. So the, these were some of the uh, setting out drawings that were sent out for those. Uh, this is a curtain wall setting out along the west side. And the, the one thing that doesn't follow that, uh, that geometry of those folds is the stone. The stone, it wraps the entire building and that follows this geometry here. So that's kind of folded all the way across the surface. So um, we want it, we, we want it and need it to work with uh, building systems that were readily available and familiar. And that meant that the building did need to be built from concrete. So, and, and this is uh, how concrete is built there. This is the finish. It's, it's board mark concrete. So this is some of the formwork. And this is actually, so this is the formwork or the false work for the roof. It's, it seems very spindly. Uh, so this is the roof being cast. So this is very large concrete roof being cast. Um, and you can see here the, the wall, uh, well, this is coming up from the stair below, but looking up at some of that uh, formwork. And this is looking from the, the crane, looking down on the, um, the formwork as it's put in place. And then this is the, the cast concrete with the upstand beams being uh, cast after the, the roof slab. So in a way, there, there was this, I suppose, strange disjunction in a way between those very precise setting out drawings and then the way of building. But we, the contractor, uh, who, um, the, the site manager was an architect and he completely took all of this on board. So uh, he worked very closely with us. Uh, the building is wrapped in stone and like wrapped in that we wanted all the lines to wrap so that you, you have that sense of this kind of object rather than uh, seeing you know, the actual thickness of the stone. Of course, we, we did want to work with stone. It is a stone area. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the stone yard in Bethlehem. So we worked uh, with the stone from Bethlehem. And the way that stone is typically used in the West Bank, I suppose most of the buildings are not insulated. And uh, the way that stone is typically used is it's just bedded on mortar and onto the concrete, or it's field stone, like it's shown here. Um, so we wanted to have this kind of these joints wrapping the building so that you really read it as an object rather than seeing the actual construction thickness of it. And w so we use this projected geometry here, uh, which meant, of course, that the stones on the roof, because they're slope on sloping surfaces, they're trapezoidal. But we ended up with just um, eight different tra uh, trapezoid t types. In terms of construction, you, you prob probably these conversations wouldn't occur, uh, well, not that often in, in Europe or in the US, but um, putting stone on metal um, um, rails is very, very uncommon. There was one building in the West Bank that did that. So we were trying to make things as manageable as possible. So we did consider putting the stone on and mortar and then on insulation and then waterproofing. But you, clearly, you couldn't get to the waterproofing. And uh, because this building is leak gold, we did, of course, have to insulate it. It's an ASHRAE. The galleries are ASHRAE. So in a way, we were working you know, we were, these standards were being taken, but not all of the elements of the, we say, the construction would be familiar with building to this standard. And in fact, having an insulated building was very unusual. And that was one of the, the things that we really needed to keep on top of, all of the detailing with that. So, um, so they're the upstand beams that provide us with a 7.2 meter grid. And then we, 
uh, had primary rails across them, uh, secondary rails, and, and put the stone on top of that. So the roof is, is almost like a wall structure in terms of the stone detail. And there are some of the, um, the initial <coughs> scheme drawings that went out. And this then is a contractor's shop drawing. Um, so the stone is complete cladding that comes down. The gutter, we didn't of course want to have a gutter visible either, so the gutter is in behind the building, the wall line there, and it's accessed from the exterior. So there's openings here in the stone, but you can see this is, I suppose, the challenge for the contractor, that on all sides. So he, uh, he, he never was able, there was no place where there was any tolerance. On all sides, the stone had to line up. Uh, and this is putting it in, in place. Uh, so there's one of the alignments. I think there's a couple of places where it doesn't line up, I have to say. Um, the, um, the, uh, most of the mechanical systems are not on the roof. So they're, uh, they're moved to the side where we had that depression on the site. But there are the inevitable soil and vent stacks, etc., that come up through some ventilation. So there, are, there, is a, there is a grill that had to go in over that, but that provides ventilation so that you don't see anything coming up above the surface of the roof. And that's there at the end of a day's work. Some of the stone um, attachments. And the other thing that was um, an issue for us was the west-facing facade. Uh, we wanted to have this view to the Mediterranean, but having large west-facing windows uh, meant that, and with that low evening sun was the worst possible thing that we could do in terms of the, the, you know, the environmental control of the building. So I suppose the first thing was to, um, was in plan, there's, so this is the west here to the left, there's a buffer zone that's created there along that west-facing facade. This is where the gallery is. The gallery is designed as a temporary exhibition, so they needed to be able to change. They wanted a black box gallery. So we have this buffer space here in front that kind of creates a, a waiting space, but also a space for pieces that are not so sensitive. Uh, and, and then on this side here, it's not as isolated from the office, but it kind of sets it back a little bit. Um, so, so this is so that's that buffer space. That wall actually needed to be insulated because what we needed to do was to try to as, put in place as many passive systems as possible to control that gallery space. Uh, and this is the space as it kind of runs along the front of that building. So it's this kind of continuous, uh, continuous run. And it does actually, even though it looks very long and narrow in plan, because it's uh, because of the geometry, it actually works quite well. You can have a group of 20 to 30 and uh, kind of serve as an introduction to the gallery. And actually at the opening, um, the, the welfare invited a, a Belgian group to do a performance there and they used that space as a stage and we all, were all outside looking at it. This is one of their rehearsals the day before the opening. Um, but even with that, even with those plans, we, we, uh, you know, those plan moves, we still needed to provide more shading to that gallery. It would have been, uh, it would have been very uncomfortable. So, or, or conversely, require an awful lot of conditioning. Uh, so we did need to provide uh, shading. Obviously, we didn't, we didn't want to put something in front of the glass. So fins are installed. Uh, vertical fins are attached into the curtain wall. And then the question was, uh, which alignment would they go? Would they go on the inner face of the wall or would they go on the um, outer face of the wall? Um, what we ultimately decided to do is where the opening is highest, the glass is on the inner face of the wall, and where it's lowest, it's on the outer face of the wall. So that gives us a very deep fin here, where we need it, and where we don't need it, it comes out, and it gives a three-dimensionality as well to that facade. These are some of the, the fins were made in uh, Dubai. That was one thing that had to come uh, from afar. Uh, it wasn't uh, possible to make it. And uh, this is one of the sample panels. It's quite a, it's actually four welded steel, uh, four steel plates welded together. It's quite chunky. Uh, and then the rest of the facade is, is very, very closed down. This is to, I suppose, reduce as much as possible the amount of solar gain that we're getting in the building. So there's only one opening on the east uh, through there. And you can see here, these are the offices. They have quite small windows, which is, works very well. It's bright there. You don't need huge windows. Uh, another issue 
of, uh, was water. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's very dry there and access to water is, is um, challenging. So, underneath, so we, we're taking all the water off the roofs and underneath this terrace here, there's a large tank. So you can see there that tank. So in a way, everything had to do double duty in some way. And the landscape is, is a seasonal landscape and it was, it was developed, so the, the landscape was kind of being developed at the same time as the building uh, so that we would get one growing cycle. We were hoping to get one growing cycle before the building opened. So this is a photo from when the terraces were put in place. Um, because the terraces are not so large, getting machinery onto them was a bit of a problem. And also the soil is very clay, so the machinery was affecting the drainage. So they ended up using mules for, uh, to till, and actually they're still using them for maintenance. This is actually the edge of the site. So that's the museum boundary. And they absolutely did not want to have a fence. They, there was a real resistance to fences because there's such a security apparatus in the West Bank that they wanted to be as open as possible. The funny thing is, I don't know it's funny, but um, because the gardens have been quite successful, um, the, there are some wild boars that have come in. So now fences had to go up, actually. But it's for the wild boar. Um, the, and we worked with Lara, the Lara Zirkat, who is in Amman, Unfortunately, Lara could not get a visa to come in, so an awful lot of the landscape approvals had to be done like this. So we'd send photos with measurements on it, and she would then assess it. So we say in this case, this root ball would be assessed from photos. She did have a colleague that went in periodically, but what was amazing was actually how much could be done that way. Um, and I think one of the things that I find sometimes a little strange is when you're looking in this view, it always seems so dry, but then when you kind of actually move into the gardens, they're, they're much lusher. And one of the things that the museum, in a way the gardens weren't really part of the brief, that was kind of, I suppose, the reaction to the site that the welfare really liked and developed. And when the museum opened, it, the building actually opened, there was no exhibition when they started. Um, so they developed this, this map of the gardens, and, and that's become a very important part of the museum for them. It also extends, if you like, the space of the museum because it creates a bigger area for people to spend time in. It is a sloping site, very steeply sloping slice, site, and um, the welfare wanted it to be accessible, so it's designed to British standards, which is very close to the ADA. So there's a straight route through the site, or there's a much more leisurely route through the site, and that is the accessible route through the site. So the straight route is almost like that quick route where you go through the terraces, so you're going, uh, you know, a garden, field, orchard, and it kind of gives you the quick story of the museum, so that's the uh, straight route, or you can take this kind of longer walk. And it has also the effect, of course, of kind of expanding again the space of the gardens because it's not so large. The entire site is only four hectares. Uh, and there, there are shortcuts as well within that space. But you know where the, the, the paths fold, it also starts to create space. So this is that amphitheater there, which was kind of, uh, we found it actually when we finally got the final survey on the site, we were able to make that. This is one of the folds in the, uh, in the path structure where people can gather. A lot of the students come on site and uh, use it because there's very little public space like this in the West Bank for people just to spend time. And finally, Anne asked me if I would show some photos of the Egyptian Museum under construction. We've, we actually finished working on this in 2008. And it is under construction. It, some of the galleries are going to open this year. Um, so uh, this is kind of, uh, that's the uh, rendering. This is the entrance into the museum. And that's it. That's more or less the same view. That, that translucent stone wall that was in front, I don't think that's going to be built. And that's looking from the inside. So this is that big courtyard space. And that's kind of on the other side of the wall. 
And that's in, uh, inside this, this court charge, the museum is uh, to, yeah, well, let's look uh, upstairs. So you can see that, to give you a sense, so there's a person there. It's a big space. The, the galleries are up at this level here. Uh, so they're up 90 meters, so you have to get, there's a, a very, very large stair that brings you up to the permanent exhibition galleries. So those two galleries, I think, are the two that are going to be open. They're the Tutankhamun galleries, uh, uh, the permanent exhibition, the remainder is on the other side of the stair. Um, oops. So that's the stair that brings you up. So the Tutankhamun are here, but actually most of the exhibition is on that side, and the, per the view to the pyramids is just at the top of the stair. So this photo is looking up the stair. So there is the permanent exhibition galleries there. There's that big window that looks to the pyramids. And just to give you, so, so the, there was one photo from here, which is the entrance. This is the big uh, courtyard space. There is a stair that brings you up, and the two tank commune galleries are these two here. And then these galleries won't be open, is my understanding, for the opening. That's the remainder of the permanent exhibition. And that's what the galleries look like in our renderings. Um, and that's uh, two tank Moon that's looking back down towards the entrance. So the the, it's op the plan opens up behind us to the pyramids, but that daylight will be taken out in this case. There's going to be a, uh, it's going to be black box, I think, for Tutankhamun. And that's another view of the same space. And this is actually, so those photos were taken last October. This photo was taken a, a few years ago, but you can see here the kind of, uh, uh, so the two galleries that are going to be open are those two, that's Tutankhamun. The stair comes up here, and these are the three of the remainder of the permanent exhibition. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was splendid. Um, We'll be able to take some questions from the audience in a moment, and I think that there are going to be microphones at either of the aisles, so if you'd like to ask a question, um, you can come towards the microphones in a few minutes. I have a few questions of my own that I'd like to start with. Um, I think one of the things that came through very, very beautifully with each of the projects... Sorry, is that better? Sorry about that. I think one of the things that came through quite wonderfully with each of the projects you showed is, as you yourself said, the role that landscape plays in the way in which you actually conceive the project, not only formally, but materially, in terms of, uh, one could even say, the metaphor of the project. And that landscape gives a series of cues that seem to find echoes through each stage of the development of the project. And at the same time, in a way that isn't quite so immediately apparent, there's an extremely sophisticated and fairly complex technology, often with the facades of the buildings or with certain aspects of the ways in which they're actually dealing with the problems that the landscape is creating. And I'm wondering to what extent, I mean, you, you've presented these projects in a way that makes it seamless, right? It, it all seems to come together quite wonderfully. But those two approaches don't necessarily seem to be um, immediately compatible. So I'm wondering if you can expand a little bit on whether there's some tension between that way of thinking about landscape and then at a certain moment beginning to use this very sophisticated technological apparatus in order to have the project actually occupy the landscape. Hmm. Um, I, well, let's see. Um, I, I suppose one of the things that we, we're inclined to, to well, is, is, if you like, to 
um, to, to take something uh, and kind of run with it uh, and, and push it, if you like, to an extreme. Like, for example, the use of the basalt of the Giant's Causeway. Because it's, um, you know, it, it, it's crazy in some ways to, to do it because it's, it'll never be done again. The, the stonemasons said to me, nobody ever, ever, ever do this again because it, it's so crazy. But, um, you know, to, if, to um, I suppose, n not be pushed back by this is the way things have always been because there's usually a way to find out to, there's usually a way to do something if you really want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in some ways, maybe the effort is so huge that it seems odd to do it. Like it's not natural in some ways, you know, to, to push things mm -hmm. to that degree. And when there was one time um, uh, we were on a review in uh, and uh, Scott Cohen asked a student, well, well, what do you like about this? And I think there's, some, there's an element of that, that you want to do it. And sometimes you kind of park maybe a more rational, like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and you know, you just do it. I don't think that's a very good uh, answer to your question. Well, maybe my question doesn't been clear. But um, I mean, I I in much of what um, is often described as landscape mm -hmm. form architecture, Oh, there's I see what you're saying. some I there's some wish saying. to either find yeah. something that's elemental sorry, sorry. or I, that I, makes yeah. all of the technicity disappear, and that doesn't seem to be sorry. What I see doing. what you're saying. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's it's not that we want to simulate the landscape. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I, I misunderstood. Yeah. No, we absolutely do not want to simulate the landscape. I mean, what maybe we're not interested in making something look like landscape. But it's rather that you don't, you don't draw a line around the building and say that's the building and that's everything around mm -hmm. it. You have to think of it as a spatial structure. So the whole thing has to work together in some way. So you just don't, you just kind of, you, f you know, you find, I suppose, the field that you're operating in. And, and we say in terms of the causeway, you know, what we did there was highly engineered. But right. let's face it, we have a million people a year going to that site. You know, mm -hmm. it's, this is not a man this is not completely natural of this, this place. So, you know, what we did was very, very highly engineered. But then what we had to decide was how far were we going with that? Mm -hmm. So what we decided was that the lines, those really strong lines, are confined to those building lines, those two cuts. And we've done work beyond that. But in that case, it's just built with a field stone, it's much softer, it doesn't have those hard geometries. So it's like, you, you try to say, okay, you know, wh wh where's, our, where's our impact and then how do we release? Just because either we're working on, on a building, we don't just confine ourselves to the building, but also we don't have to deal with absolutely everything on the site. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a judgment, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. And is it fair to say that that highly engineered quality or that extremely sophisticated technological aspect of the work in some sense isn't declaring itself, that it's, it's not immediately evident? One wouldn't think, looking at those extraordinary basalt columns, that in fact they're essentially a reinforced yeah. Yeah, structure. I'm uh, absolutely. I mean, the point isn't to show the engineering. I mm -hmm. mean, th there is some uh, amazing engineering, but we've been very lucky, actually, on those three projects. We worked with the same engineer with Francis Archer at Arab. And he, the thing is that, you know, you develop a design approach, and then it's how are you going to do it? Mm -hmm. And you find the m best way to do it. But it's not about saying, oh, look at me. Right. You're, you're, you're working to find how to do it together. So it's not about kind of demonstrating. So ultimately ingenuity. it's still all in the service of that first intuition about landscape or how the landscape's going to be used. Um, say that again? Well, I'm, I'm, again, maybe I'm pushing it too far, but it's just this question of, again, the extraordinary means that you're bringing to um, reinforce this idea which you've presented as something so simple and gestural and ultimately grounded in landscape. And um, I think that that's 
personally, I find that quite seductive. Mm -hmm. um, but in each of those four projects, there was this moment when you kind of pulled the cover back and said, and here are all the things that are actually right. making that happen. Uh, actually, we find that really interesting, I have to say. It's mm -hmm. kind of, it, it, it's, you know, you, you, it, it's at that point where you kind of say, okay, this is what you want. And then to really follow it through, what you needs to do to get it done. I find that actually quite interesting, all the stuff that happens in between. Because I think it's so easy to, to take shortcuts. But actually, if you follow the logic of it through, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. So yes, at the end, it looks, it looks extraordinarily simple. Mm -hmm. Like the stone on the Palestinian Museum, we could not have done that if the contractor um, for us, uh, Tubeli, was not willing to spend the amount of time drawing through that because it took an enormous effort to, to do that in a place where stone is normally just put onto buildings, right. but that, that took a huge effort. Uh, and, and he was d just willing to do it, uh, the same as the Giant's Causeway. And I think we were lucky, we were very lucky with those two projects, because the Palestinian Museum meant an awful lot to people. So it wasn't just another commercial building. The Giant's Causeway meant an awful lot to people in Northern Ireland, and the stonemasons were willing to do it. Uh, nobody made money from those projects. Mm -hmm. And there was kind of an investment that they were willing to do that. So that was a bit of luck. So I mentioned in the brief introduction that you've uh, done an extraordinary number of buildings mm -hmm. that are the results of competitions, <laughs> or at least it seems like yeah. an impressive list. Um, I wonder if you'd talk just a little bit about that, about a practice which finds itself engaged um, with such frequency in competitions, and competitions for buildings, many of which are cultural programs? Um, some of it is you know, self-fulfilling in a way, because I suppose at a certain point when you do cultural projects, you get on shortlist for cultural projects, and then you do more cultural projects. So there's an element of that, definitely. Um, I mean, we, we did competitions because we couldn't get work any other way, honestly. Mm -hmm. And you know, we did a lot of competitions. Um, and when you do a lot, you probably get better at them. You know, when you look at all the ones where you didn't get any place and you start to realize, well, what is it I'm doing wrong? So you start to, to learn. So like in New York, we spent years doing competitions uh, before we finally won a building. I think we must have spent seven years doing competitions. So, you know, th there's, there's that. Um, and I mean, we still do a lot. And we still lose a lot as well. Really, we do. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but but you definitely like at this point we're more inclined to do competitions where we get uh, pre-qualified and onto a shortlist. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we d wouldn't do as many open competitions anymore. So it can be argued and. Many people have made the argument that uh, for a museum program in particular, a competition is a particularly bad way to go about getting a building. And the argument goes something like the specificity of the collection, when there is a collection, or the set of choreographed experiences that are intended to be part of visiting the museum uh, depend either on objects or on a curatorial vision that is notoriously difficult to actually mm -hmm. put in a competition document. And you know, you can see the results of all the competitions that have gone bad for really prestigious and quite wonderful collections where that element of communication between mm -hmm. the people who actually um, maintain and give a curatorial vision to the presentation of the objects had very, very little to do with the people who were orchestrating the competition. You seem to have managed to avoid that, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that tension and how you resolve it. I think, I think that, in a way, it's about pitching a competition. I mean, sometimes we do competitions where there's like 10 A0 boards, and it's like, it's nonsense. You don't need that much mm -hmm. to select an architect. So in a way, it's about molding what you want, uh, what do you want out of it. So uh, I, I, our experience has been a awful lot of the time, it's some form of a site strategy that wins. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if that's the case, you don't need all these acres. And that's what allows sometimes that, those other voices, because you're right. 
a lot of the time we do a lot of detail because the competition requires it. But you know very well that as soon as whoever wins, wins, then there's going to be discussion and there's going to be changes. So I, I think it's, it's, it's kind of finding a way to say, okay, what do you want out of it? And defining that in the brief and then um, leaving it open enough for all of those other inputs that come afterwards because absolutely there's an awful lot of things you cannot do until you meet the client or meet all of the other people that are going to inform. I mean with the Palestinian Museum that was a competition but they left it quite open at the beginning and um, the Giants Causeway was also it, it was a bit more defined but there was years of discussion in both of those projects after the competition, a huge amount of change. And in the Grand Egyptian Museum, where there was a very specific collection? The, the Grand Egyptian, well, they didn't know what the collection was. We knew Tutankhamun was coming in, but mm -hmm. we didn't know what else was coming in. Um, we, I suppose in, in that case, there was an exhibition designer that joined our team and uh, did an exhibition master plan. And then, um, and then n now there's another exhibition designer working on it. I think it would have benefited from have had, having had much more discussion with the curators and a director because in, in a way that was always lacking. So, you know, there are certain questions that, you know, can only be answered when whoever is coming in and is going to be, it's going to be their museum. Mm -hmm. Because in a way we're doing the building, you know, but the museum is much right. more than the building. So um, we, we, it didn't have the benefit of those discussions about, you know, how, how do they want the visitor arrival to work or, mm -hmm. for example, was it, what, was it going to be one museum or was it there Tutankhamun and the permanent collection? There was a view, you know, that, that it should actually, Tutankhamun should be seen in the context of the entire collection. I mean, a, a whole lot of, and, mm -hmm. and that those discussions go on. So I think that project would have benefited, the design would have benefited a huge amount from those discussions. But I think the competition, you know, it's, it can be flexible. Things can change mm -hmm. a lot. Um, shall we take some questions from the audience, if there are some? I can't see, so if anyone, yes. It's, uh, it was onyx, actually. Yeah, because alabaster, th that's, and um, that's a, uh, there's about 25,000 square meters of stone, so that's about a quarter of a million square feet. Um, and th that amount of alabaster would be extremely difficult to, to, uh, to quarry, to get. When all this work you did show is finished in that, that beautiful stone wall all the way that's the last I, I don't think that stone wall is going to be built. That's what I've heard. Any idea what would be built in its place? I don't know. I see. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. I, um, that we, we, we did that project up to construction, but the, the construction stage team um, are dealing with it. And I, I, I'm not sure what's happening with that wall, because to quarry that stone alone would take a few years the amount of stone that's in it. When we were, we had identified stone that could be used, but it would have taken, at the time, it was maybe two years to quarry the stone. I mean, the stone can go on because that wall is an independent, it's designed as an independent wall in front of the environmental wall, so it could come in later on. Um, there's no reason it can't, but... Um, Other questions? Thank you very much, a very beautiful work. Um, I have some more questions about competitions. Uh, the first one is, um, how do you select what competition you want to do? And related to that, um, once you start doing one, it seems like uh, you become to, you start to know quite a bit, for example, about canoes or Palestinian geography or Egyptian antiquities and how do you approach kind of having to learn something maybe that you had no idea about and kind of uh, integrate that with the, with the design. Um, how do we, well, how do we approach or uh, select them? 
Um, if we find them interesting and if they have a good jury. And uh, I think the other thing is who's organizing them because some, competition, some competitions are organized by people who, you know, they, they, they seem to go forward and others don't. So, it, you know, if, if we feel that the project doesn't have any life afterwards, we probably wouldn't do it. Um, and and I, now we tend to try to get pre-qualified a lot more. Um, then the, and, and oh, actually, there's one very uh, important thing is how much do they want? Because if somebody's asking for models for a huge amount of material, you kind of wonder, well, it, it's a huge amount of money to put in. And if it's an open competition, you know, realistically, your chances are quite low. So, you know, you kind of have to think about it. Uh, Egypt was a two-stage competition. So the first stage, we just needed to put in five 11 by 17 boards. So, you know, that's it's not so much work. So it's fairly easy to do. And, you know, in terms of, I suppose, then the learning, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. But obviously, the projects I presented are ones that we've also worked on. So some of the competitions I wouldn't know as much about, but as you keep working through the projects, you know a bit more. But I mean, I find that interesting, learning about all these things. Kind of go around cities around the world, know, knowing something about a particular area, because we did a competition there. Um, so uh, I like that part. How do, you find, how do you decide if it's a good jury or not? Well, that's a good question. Uh, but you know, if, if if there is a competition and everybody, uh, well, for example, if there's no architect on the jury, we probably wouldn't do it. And there are competitions that are no architects on the jury because that means that their, their decision process is going to be a bit different. Um, actually, that's, it's, and then after that, you know, if you're looking at, at the jury, that they're architects, even if they're not people that we would necessarily do the work, but if there are there are architects that are serious about design, so then you know that there's a, going to be a different priority uh, to the discussion. Uh, I mean, on the Egyptian Museum, Peter Cook selected ours, and you know, in general, you, you wouldn't have naturally thought that that was a natural fit for him. But um any other questions? Well, then let me thank you again, and on behalf of everyone. <laughs>